Let's uh, take our Bibles and open, please, to the book of Deuteronomy. And I'd like you to turn to chapter 1. We're going to do an introduction and an overview of outline of the book of Deuteronomy. This will be a, uh, several studies. I, I, I did this study uh, about three or four months ago and had been going over it and trying to get all my references and everything co correct and, and straight. And so I hope that it'll be a blessing and give us some new insights. A lot of people, you know, don't want to study uh, the Pentateuch. Uh, we have five books. We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These are known in theological ranks as the Pentateuch. And uh, which is the law of God. And they outline for us uh, how God would deal with the nation. And Deuteronomy opens with Israel in the land of Moab. And they're awaiting instructions from God to enter the land of Canaan. Let's begin reading in verse 1. There be the words, these be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side Jordan, in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea, between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahab. There are eleven days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. Now, just for uh, attention's sake, Kadesh Barnea was where they faced their great test. Kadesh Barnea is when they would look at the land and they would send spies to check the land out. And the Lord had told them He was going to give them the land, but this was all a part of God's sovereign plan. So they went in to check it out, and there were 12 of them. Ten of the spies came back with a negative report. They said, we can't do it. They said, there are giants in the land. Now, they said the land was flowing with milk and honey, and, and they brought back grapes, clusters of grapes. That one cluster took two men uh, with, with a pole to carry it. But when they got back to all the camp, which scholars say there was between uh, one to four million people gathered together that had come from the Red Sea, that left Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and now they were ready to enter into the land of Canaan. And there at Kadesh Barnea, they refused. They balked at God's command and they would not cross over. Now for this reason, God told them that every one of them, except for uh, Joshua and Caleb, would perish. That the whole generation would die in the wilderness because they had refused to follow God and to follow Moses, his servant. And it was a very painful experience because uh, it was an opportunity of great blessings, but the people would not be obedient. Now, it goes on and says, It came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake, unto the children of Israel according unto all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them after he had slain Sihon the king of the Am Amorites which dwelt in Heshbon and Og the king of Bashan who also was a giant we'll, we'll cover Og a little bit later which dwelt at Ashtaroth in Edrei, 
Now, Ashtaroth was a center of Baal worship. And of course, no doubt, uh, these kings were very much involved in, in these uh, very immoral uh, types of, of uh, worship to their false gods. And it says in verse 5, on this side Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law. And he started by saying, so it opens with the children of Israel encamped, awaiting instructions from God. All the men, all the women, all the children, officers, and all of the sojourners with them had assembled to hear Moses speak. Now, we learned that from Deuteronomy 29. So if you'll turn over there, uh, we're going to try to lay the introductory groundwork. And in Deuteronomy 29, um, by the way, since we're at Deuteronomy 29, uh, Deuteronomy We'll, just, we'll deal with that later. Deuteronomy 29, verses 10 through 12. He says, You stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders, your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and thy strangers that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood unto the drawer of thy water that thou shouldst enter into covenant with the Lord thy God and into his oath which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God as he said unto thee, and as he has sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So all the people were gathered together. The prophet of God delivers three sermons in the people's hearings. That's Moses. Moses delivers these uh, three sermons. The first sermon starts at verse 6 of chapter 1. And it goes to chapter 4 and verse 40. That's his first sermon. The second sermon begins in chapter 5, verse 1, and it goes through chapter 26. And then the last and final sermon is from chapter 27 to 31. Moses concludes the book with the song of Moses that he gives in the 32nd chapter. And then in chapter 33, there's a blessing uh, pronounced upon the people. And Moses reveals the harsh fact that Israel has failed God. Now, the places that we want to note this is, look with me in Deuteronomy 9 and verse 6. Deuteronomy 9 and verse 6. The Bible says, Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. And if you look all the way over to verse 13 of the same chapter, Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, literally, the, the Hebrew word, um, it carries the idea of being uh, obstinate, stubborn, uh, backward, 
it, it carries the idea of, of an animal that refuses to follow the lead of its master. Right now I'm working with a, with a young horse and one of the first things you have to train a horse to do is to lead. So when you take the halter, you have a lead rope and you pull the halter gently and the horse follows. Now when you first start out, they don't want to do that. They'll, they'll just stand right back and they'll, you know, and then if you pull harder, they'll just keep right on pulling and you'll end up ruining the animal. So you've got to gain their trust. You go up, you put your arm around them, uh, you, you, you be gentle to the horse and you gained its trust and then you, you move with the horse and little by little then the horse begins to follow you. Now I'm talking about a young horse, a young animal. And as, as that animal learns to trust you, it will follow you. Now I know that people are much different and, uh, but when we're little children, we grow up in life and you know, we start to walk, we take our first steps and mom and dad are there, we hope. And, and you know, they'll say, I remember ours would say, come to daddy and then she'd walk to daddy and then she'd turn around and say, I'll walk to mommy and she'd walk to mommy. And then when you'd, they'd get a little bigger, you'd take them out for walks and, you know, and then, then at some point, the child gets big enough and they decide they don't want to walk with you anymore. And you try to pull them. I've seen mothers before, uh, you know, trying to get their children to do something and just tugging them, you know. They don't want to go. Well, that's kind of the idea here. They're stiff-necked. They, uh, they're stubborn. They're obstinate. They're, they're backward. They, they just don't want to listen. And... This is a part of our depraved nature. As, uh, as, as children, we grow up, you know, we get to be uh, 15, 16, we think we know everything. Uh, I don't know why that is, but, you know, a lot, of, a lot of young people, they think, boy, I'm 16, I know everything now. And really, you don't know anything. Uh, really, you're, you're just beginning. But uh, this is part of, of the... Uh, persistence we see with the children of Israel and um, it reveals that they had failed God and we notice that it continues on because as, as you turn to chapter 31 of Deuteronomy and verse number 16 it says and the Lord said unto Moses behold thou shalt sleep with thy fathers and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them, now notice, and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Now God knew that Israel would break the covenant. He told them, if you obey me, and you walk with me, and you love me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, then I will bless you. And he told them all the, the multiple blessings that would come upon them. But he said, if you don't obey me, then these are the things I'm going to do. Now we're going to, we're going to look at those here in, in a moment. But I wanted you to get a grasp of that, to see how that God tells them even before that they're not going to follow him. And notice he says, you'll forsake me and you'll break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them. And I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. And many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? And that's just the way man is. You know, we want to do it our way. 
And then when, when our way don't work, we want to blame it on God. Well, you know, I can't believe God let this happen to me. I was uh, discussing a, a woman had called me and was wanting some advice about debt. And she wanted to know whether they should file for bankruptcy. And uh, I said, well, how long have y'all been running up debt? And she said, about 20 years. And I said, do y'all have a budget that you live within? And she said, we have one, but we never, we never live within the budget. We're always borrowing money on credit cards. And, and I said, ma'am, you can't do that. You have to live within your means. She said, well, we just can't. And I said, well, you got to find a way to do that. you got to cut corners. you got to cut out things. you got to cut back. you got to do without. you you got to even sometimes. You've got to. There's nothing wrong with sacrificing uh, to be able to make it. It's not always just going to be, well, anything I want, it's going to be mine. It just don't happen that way. You know, many people have to drive cars that are 20 years old, 30 years old. Uh, they have to make it the best they can. And uh, so as I was talking to her and telling her, you know, she's saying, thinking that it could all just get fixed in a, in a real quick time. And I said, ma'am, it took you 20 years to get here. And you're not going to overnight just clap your hands and this be fixed. You and your husband need uh, to be in, in a good church. You need to sit down with your pastor. He needs to talk to you and try to help you so you can have a budget and live within that budget. When she told me how much they made, I told her, I said, well, ma'am, you all make twice as much as we make. And uh, I said, I know a lot of people that make far less than you do, and they survive very well. But, you know, what do people do with their money? I know, I know it's, it's something that sometimes people don't realize, but people get in a habit, well, I'm going to stop at the store, and I'm going to buy me this, and I'm going to buy that, and they'll, they'll buy $15, $20 worth of junk. And then every morning they do that. And then for lunch, they'll spend $10, $15 on this. And then by the end of the week, you get to adding up all that you've spent in seven days, and you've spent your whole paycheck, and you've got nothing left. And by simply saying, well, you know, nothing wrong with drinking water, nothing wrong with cutting out stuff that I don't really need, and, uh, and if we'll make those cuts and you learn to live within your means, things will work out a lot better for you in life. Well, the children of Israel, uh, they would not obey God, and because they tried to do it their way, it failed them, and they could not uh, figure out what was going wrong, so what they did was they blamed it on God. Now, Moses did not have much faith in the people's convictions. You know, one of the things that's lacking in our world today is that people don't have strong convictions about what's right and what's wrong. Uh, people have opinions, but what are your convictions? You know, what, is, what are things that you're going to live by and you will not violate them? You know, that's something that we all should have in our life. When I started out uh, as a, a preacher, uh, I saw the different churches that compromised, and, and I saw the groups that were compromising, and I vowed I'll, I'll never be a part of that. I won't do that. I'm not going to go to a church just to get nickels and noses, and I'm not going to compromise and just t tell people what they want to hear. I'm going to preach the Bible. I'm going to preach it in context. And if people don't like the Bible, then I'm wasting my time anyway. 
because the Bible is the only thing that's going to stand the test of time. A lot of folks will compromise their standards. And this was true of the nation of Israel. Notice in chapter 9, for just a moment, uh, what Moses says about them in uh, chapter 9 uh, of Deuteronomy. I went too far to the book of Numbers. Deuteronomy chapter 9. The Bible says in verse number 24, I believe, um, yeah, the Bible says here, You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Now think about that. And, and this is Moses speaking. He's saying that from the time that God called me, remember Moses had fled to the desert after he had slain the Egyptian. And he'd been in the desert for 40 years. He was 40 when he killed the Egyptian. And he was spent 40 in the desert. Then God called him back for the final years of his life. And he says here, you have been rebellious. How? Against the Lord. From the day that I knew you. Now, I don't want to be like that, do you? I don't want to rebel against what God says. God's word is true, and I want to obey it. Well, now, look at verse 31, uh, and ver chapter 31 and verse 27. Uh, he makes, this is after uh, some time has passed. I don't want you to notice how his opinion has not changed. Verse number 27, chapter 31. For I know thy rebellion. You see, he had, he had walked with them. Remember when, when they crossed the Red Sea, they were all celebrating, remember? And then they got to looking around and they had no water and they had no food. And they said, what are we going to do, Moses? We got no water, we got no food. Well, they started murmuring. And the Bible says that they were ready to stone Moses. Because, you know, they were not trusting God by faith. Our life is faith. The just shall live by faith. My wife and I were discussing this this week. We were talking about something and, you know, she was talking about different things she was concerned about. And I said, darling, I know we're concerned, but, you know, we live by faith. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, Kathy and I could get in our car and head back home and be killed in a car wreck this afternoon. We don't know. Now, we pray that don't happen, but if it does, we know where we're going. You never know when somebody's going to be out there, a drunk driver, or a deer's going to run in front of you, or whatever's going to happen, and... The Lord may call you home. But I want and we should want our lives to be in harmony with God. And I believe that the Lord takes care of His people. I know the Lord has saved me from death multiple times. Multiple times. The, the only answer for me living is that God intervened. Car wrecks, you know, Probably all of you have been through that. And notice he says, and thy stiff neck. Now that's, this is referred to a number of times. I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, you have been rebellious against the Lord, and how much more after my death. Now, there were true words never spoken because you know that after his death, uh, Joshua would take over and Joshua would lead them into the land, but that whole generation would die and Joshua and Caleb were the only two 
And then even Moses himself got into trouble because he smote the rock. Instead of speaking to the rock, he lost his temper. And the Lord told him, you're not going to enter the land because you have disobeyed me. And Moses allowed his temper to get the better of him. That didn't mean he lost his salvation, but he just simply, he's a man. And men, men and women, we're, we're all flesh, and we all have, have problems, and we can all sin, we can all fail. Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes, your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. So Moses is doing everything in his power to warn the people and to encourage them. Now the theme of the book is revealed in God's love, God's patience, and God's forbearance with the nation. Though they had miserably failed him, and they continued to fail him, he continues to tell them, that he loves them. They are miserable people and they continue to be that way, but he says he's still going to give them the land. Look now um, at Deuteronomy 34 and verse 4. There's a little hidden gem there. And the Lord said unto him, I'm in 34 verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, Isaac, unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. He got to see it. God promised him that. And he promised him the land, but you're not going to go in. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab. Now, you remember where they started? Remember what I read to you in chapter 1 and verses 1? They were in the land of Moab. So even though they spend these 40 years, they are still in the land of Moab. For he says in Deuteronomy 1, uh, verse number 1, These be the words which Moses spake to Israel on this side Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea. And uh, he goes on to, to tell them that he's in Moab. Uh, Verse number 2, these 11 days journey, uh, they're going to go from Horeb by the way to Seir to Kadesh Barnea. And they're still in Moab. And Moses dies still in Moab. Now we see also that um, the fact that they had disobeyed the Lord he was forbearing with them. He was gracious to them. And when the question is answered, we have a better understanding of God's grace in our lives today. That God um, is very patient. God is long-suffering. His mercies are new every day. My, if God dealt with us the way we dealt with others, you know, it'd be an awful thing, wouldn't it? If God was as unforgiving as we are, if God was as vengeful as we can be, but God is slow to wrath, He's of great mercy, and His goodness is unsearchable. Now, when you look at the date Moses writes, in the days which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we come over the brook Zered were thirty and eight years until all the generation of the men of war were consumed from the midst of the camp as 
Jehovah had sworn unto them. So the hand of God was against them to destroy them from the midst of the camp until they were consumed. Now let's, let's read that for ourselves. Let's look at Deuteronomy 2, verse number 14. Deuteronomy 2, verse 14. And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come over the brook Zered was thirty and eight years until all the generations of the men of war were wasted out from among the host as the Lord swore unto them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them, notice this, to destroy them from among the host until they were consumed. So it came to pass when all the men of war were consumed and dead from among the people that the Lord spake to me saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab this day. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. So he told him, don't even mess with the people of Ammon. We note that as we're going to see later on, they did talk to them, and they refused to even give them passage. God would later bring judgment upon them for that very thing. And uh, we see also the crossing of the brook. Zared brought Israel to the borders of Ammon and marked the separation of the unfaithful Israelites who had faltered at first at Kadesh Barnea. Moses marks a 38-year time frame where Israel left Kadesh Barnea to the coming over the brook Zared, that the rebellious generation was done away with. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at Deuteronomy 1 and verse 3. And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according unto all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. Moses marks the 11th month of the 40th year as their time of leaving Egypt to their current place in Moab. They had spent three months getting to Sinai from Egypt now, we're not going to take time to, to look at that, but if you want to, Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, and Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, tells about the three-month journey. Israel spends approximately 12 months at Sinai getting the law of God. That's in Numbers 10. You can read all about how the mountain was on fire and Moses went up, and God gave them the law. Thirty-eight years later, Israel finds herself in the plains of Moab. Numbers 33, 38, and as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 14, which uh, verifies the same time when they left Kadesh Barnea, Yet to have entered Canaan, Deuteronomy opens at the 40th year and the 11th month. Um, two of the uh, theologians, Smith and Fields, put the date of Deuteronomy around 1407 before Christ. That's roughly 1400 years before Jesus was born. The message of Moses to the people 
was about 30 days. He preached about a 30-day sermon. You know, people talk about revival. And uh, years ago, they would, they'd meet for months. Well, this, this time, Moses meets for about 30 days. And the way you can get that is from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 3, all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 8. And you can get the time frame of about 30 days. Joshua in chapter 2 verse 22 and Joshua 4:19 makes reference to those 30 days. Now with the message that uh, Moses preaches, the message of Deuteronomy is viewed by some as one of the most negative sermons that was ever expounded. Israel's failures without hesitation or the fear of man. Moses exposes the people's sin at Sinai when they make the golden calf and called upon it as their God. Look with me quickly if you would and uh, we'll close here momentarily. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 16. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy 9, verse 16, And I looked, and behold, you have sinned against the Lord your God, and have made you a molten calf. You had, you had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands, and I break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord, as at the first 40 days and 40 nights, I did neither eat bread nor drink water. Can you imagine going 40 days and 40 nights and not eating or drinking? Because of all your sins which you've sinned. I mean, this man's heart, he was given a heart to love these people. And he grieved over their sins. He didn't delight in their sins. Look at our president and how he delights in sin. Instead of telling people the things that are right, he gloats. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely incredible that on, on the day of the resurrection of Christ, the White House puts out a celebration of Transgender Day so that they can gain more recognition. Now, does a president who loves a country do such a thing? I don't think so. Now, I don't try to get into politics, and I really try to just stay clear. But I'm telling you that if a man doesn't love his country and love the people that he is president over he's not going to serve those people well you've got to love people same is true of a pastor God has to put a love in your heart for your people or you would grow so discouraged that you would give up notice it says for all your sins which you have sinned and doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger for I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. You hear that? And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. Moses was praying for his brother. He didn't want God to destroy the people. He didn't want him to destroy Aaron. So he's pleading for them. This is, this is a type of Christ. He's interceding. Verse 21, And I took your sin, the calf which you had made. 
I burned it with fire. I stamped it and ground it very small, even until it was as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. And you remember what the calf was made of, don't you? Solid gold. I mean, we're talking about gold. And Moses broke it up and ground it down so fine that it became just a powder and then they poured it out. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. Well, I don't want to get sidetracked here. I've got a lot of material to try and cover. Uh, Moses reminds Israel that God had commanded them to take this journey from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea, that they would go up and possess the land of Canaan. And we looked at that in chapter 1, verse 19, 20. But Israel would not go up. They rebelled against the commandment of Jehovah, their God. So, we'll close with this. Let's go to Deuteronomy 1. I'm sorry we didn't get to cover more ground, but um, I thought I could cover more, but I didn't get to. Look at verse 26 of Deuteronomy 1. Notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents, and you said, because the Lord hated us. He hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. You notice how quickly people forget where they came from? I mean, just a short while, they're in Egypt. They're in bondage. They're slaves. And by the hand and power of God, the Lord has brought the ten plagues upon Egypt. He's led them out, and He's parted the Red Sea. He's given them manna from heaven. He's given them quail. And all they can do is say, Well, God has hated us and brought us forth the land to destroy us. Reminds you of these little kids. I remember many, many years ago, my sister, um, I won't call her name, but uh, she wanted to do something really bad, and it wasn't good for her. And mom and dad said no. And I'll never forget, she said, you hate me. You all hate me. And she just kept right on saying that. Mom said, Debbie, we don't hate you. I called her name. I'm sorry, Debbie. <laughs> Forgive me, Debbie, for telling this on you. But she really, really, you know, she was so upset about what she wanted. I'm sure I've done the same thing. I'm sure that we've probably all done it. We want something real bad. We don't get it. Well, you just hate me, God. You don't really care about me. And this is what the children of Israel were saying against God. And the Bible says, you murmured in your tents, and you said he brought us to deliver us to the hand of the Amorites. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. Notice how they exaggerate. Notice that. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. All the way to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims. Now, yeah, you look at a 10-foot tall man and that's, that's going to shake you up a little bit. But remember, the Lord said, wherever you put your feet, I'm going to give it to you. Folks, we go up against giants every day. 
You know, there, there are things that, humanly speaking, are impossible to us. But with God, it's not. Look at all the challenges that we have in our lives. And we either choose to trust God and be obedient. And as we begin our revival meeting, I'm praying that God will be merciful to us and do a great work among our people. And we might see people saved and see the Lord move in a mighty way. And um, the Lord had promised that He would uh, know their hearts, whether they would obey Him or not, in chapter 8 and verse 2. And then He would reveal their failures in their wanderings in the wilderness. So we'll stop there. And uh, we only covered, I think, one page of our introductory notes, but uh, we'll continue on with our study of Deuteronomy. I pray it'll be a blessing. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for all your blessings. Lord, we pray you'd help us, uh, give us strength to do your will. Lord, I thank you for letting me preach today. This morning when I got up at 4 o'clock, I I thought, Lord, I'll never be able to do this. But you gave me strength, and I'll thank you. We pray now that you'll go with us. Thank you for the people who are here. Bless them really well, Lord. Give them a double portion, I pray, because they've been faithful and they've been here to, this afternoon. Please bless our revival, Lord. Would you move in our midst? Please bless our pastor that's coming, Brother Danny Holt. And Lord, we've gone into the community and we've passed out flyers and we've talked to people and we've encouraged them. Now, Lord, it's up to you. And it's all up to you, Lord, because even the power to go was you. So we pray your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. I shine in